morning, um, I just want to uh, say a greetings, uh, not only to all of you here in Lighthouse, but I want to say a greetings to our y YouTube followers. Uh, we are having uh, uh, almost every month a thousand uh, hits, so it's always going up. So we know that you are following with us um, every week, the sermon. So we want to include you in our welcome this morning. It says, welcome to you uh, as well. The Word of God is alive and it transcends the wall of this church, and we are very happy about, uh, about this. Praise the Lord. Can we pray for a moment? Father God, we want to turn to your word this morning and we ask your Holy Spirit, the, the revealer, the inspirer, the teacher, uh, to guide us into this uh, uh, time and your word. Lord, We are your disciples and you say that the truth will set us free. Your word is like a hammer. Uh, your word is like a fire. Uh, your word is alive and it, it penetrates our hearts, Lord. And your heart, your word is like a, a mirror in which we, we look and we see what we look like spiritually and we can compare to the standards of your word. And Lord, your Holy Spirit, take this word and apply it into our own, our own life and help us to, to live in, in such a manner that it glorifies Jesus Christ. So Lord, we, we look up to your word we, we hide your word into our hearts so that we will not sin against you. We, we cherish uh, your word as our greatest possession. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. Lord, we need your word, uh, the, the living word, a fresh word. And Lord, we pray that it will be such uh, this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So this morning... I want to talk about the revelation of Jesus Christ uh, in Revelation chapter 1. We have looked already, it would be our third uh, session in the book of Revelation. Uh, we've already looked at some uh, further events, the, the four horses and the riders of Re Revelation. Uh, we looked at the global visions. We looked at the seven seals already. But this morning I want to go back to the beginning of the book because this, this book, Revelation, it's written for you. It is for you who are sitting here today. Uh, somebody told me not too long ago, Pastor, I've always been afraid to read the book of Revelation. Uh, it scares me. I, I'm not sure I will understand it and everything. So I think you will be encouraged this morning uh, by the, the message. Many times we, we often uh, read too quickly the opening verses of Revelation because we are in a hurry to, to, to get to the earthquakes, to, to the blood, to, to all the, the strange uh, pictures that we have, the beast, the false prophets, you know, and everything. So we want, this, we, we want to pay attention to that. So we quickly read over chapter 1, and chapter 1 is so, so important uh, for us. So, so take your time to meditate over the opening verse of Revelation. You will find a great comfort and a great encouragement for your faith right now. Because this book is written to the church, as we will see uh, this morning. And I want to use this, this chapter also to insist on this uh, book has been written to exhort each one of us to maintain or renew this very close uh, intimacy with Jesus Christ. This is an invitation to come close, to re remain in Him, uh, to, to use prayer, to, to, to really trust Him for who He is. And we will learn more. And I want to draw your attention to two facts this morning. Uh, we will see how close uh, John was uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to Jesus Christ and what was the result to him that he has been so close to Jesus Christ. And the second point is how Jesus is close to his church and that includes you, how he is uh, uh, reaching out, how he is involved, how, how, how much he knows about churches. Uh, all the churches in Hong Kong, you know, we, we like to 
to be together, the international churches, last time we were 27 pastors together. We are so different, you know. Seldom I, I visit another church because I'm always here on Sunday, but last year, I think two times, uh, I, I could visit other churches in the afternoon. And these are great churches, but they are so different. So different and the music style, so different and the style to, to present and their decoration, the things that they emphasize. And, and it's not something good or bad, it's just so different. But the Lord Jesus Christ is so involved and he knows so much about our church, what we are doing right, wrong, strong or weak. He knows everything. So uh, as an intro this morning, Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 and 2. And we read the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants. To show who? Servants. His servants. Are you a servant of Jesus Christ? Yes. yes. So this revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to John to show to you. Okay, so this is already clear. It's established to show you things which must shortly take place. We have it uh, on the, the PowerPoint here. And he sent and signify it by his angel to his servant, John. Uh, and I want to, to pay attention to the word signify here because it is so, so important. This word signify. Signify is a word used in the New Testament like a sign, a miraculous, an outward supernatural sign. So when Jesus Christ gave this revelation to John, he did it like in a supernatural way, like a sign, a divine sign, like a, a revealing, and it was something outward out of the ordinary to give a, a sign. And it was an angel that came to deliver. That is great. It was a very special message and he did it to, to bring a, a sign. And then we also will learn in this book that this book of Revelation is accessible to all believers. Okay, you know why? Because it is based on the Old Testament. It is continuing the New Testament. The, the, this book has 500 allusions to the Old Testament. So you know when we want to interpret all the symbolism of, of uh, uh, you know, the symbolism of Revelation, we need to uh, just uh, not go too, too, too far away and the allegory, you know, and try to get too weird, you know, in our trying to uh, identify the, the, the Antichrist is the, the Pope or, you know, this kind of things or who is the, this warrior and everything in, in actual politics. Because it is to give us a message and it is based on the Bible. So there's, there's a lot of it that we should uh, learn. Re Revelation chapter 1, verse, verse 4 and 5. So I don't know if we have any problem. I think we have problems with the, the computer. Maybe we need a restart or something. Or, uh, so stay, stay with me and then we will, we will do our best. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. When you read the description that John gives us of this vision, let the truth of Jesus Christ penetrate. Don't go too fast. There's a lot for us to get, to, to receive. This is a special revelation and in its introduction it says something important to deepen our faith in Jesus Christ, to strengthen our commitment to follow uh, Jesus no matter what the cost will be. Because this book was written in a time of very, very severe persecutions to the churches where people could have been very justified to abandon and to walk away because it was so hard to be a Christian in that time and we'll talk a bit about that. So this book is, is important. I, each description of Jesus Christ has something to deepen our faith and to encourage us. Look at three uh, titles given to Jesus starting in verse 5. Faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, and ruler over the kings. 
Wow, this is so encouraging. In a time of uh, heavy persecutions, this speaks of Jesus, the faithful witness, Jesus' reliability, his trustworthiness. He is the faithful witness. Jesus went to the end. Jesus fulfilled the mission that he had been given for your redemption. He's done it all. He's been faithful. He spoke the truth. He never walked, walked away of anything. He completed his mission. So he's fully reliable. You can depend. You can, you know, trust Jesus Christ with your life. Whatever trouble you're in, whatever situation you're going through, you can rely on Jesus Christ completely. He's the firstborn of the dead. Not only here, he, uh, we can uh, read it as he is risen from the dead, the first one to 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 live in the glory. He received a glorious body. He went back to the Father and he sat at the highest place of honor at the right hand. But more than that, the, the firstborn is often used in the New Testament as a, as a description of a position, of rank. Jesus Christ is the first above, the first in rank. When, when he conquered that, he is the, the one above everything. And he is the ruler over the kings. As we have already discussed in our two first sessions, uh, G uh, Jesus, Jesus Christ has many enemies. And, the, and his church and his followers has many enemies, many persecutors. And there will be, there will be countless numbers of martyrs and, and people who have suffered for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So ruler over the kings. Jesus Christ is portrayed into this uh, 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 book as the all-powerful king. There's no other king, there's no government, there's no enemies that will resist. Like Pastor Jennifer in her prayer this morning said, uh, there, soon Jesus Christ will come and all knee will bow. All tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This will come, this day will come. So you're already on the right side. So, but this description is, is the ruler over the kings, whatever kings. If we continue in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, this 5b or the second part, then we will see something that speaks about uh, our relationship, a, a relationship between Jesus and us. To him who loved us, and because he loved us, he washed us from our sins and his own blood. So this is so important. We speak of a relationship with us. We believe in him. This is something unique to you. The unbelievers cannot have this experience. This is some, a, a, a privilege, a position. This is like, notice the order. First love, second he washed. He did something. He made you acceptable. He made, he, he made you in a way that you are prepared to enjoy eternity with Him. He's done it already for you. And then He has made us kings and priests to His God and Father. This is so wonderful because this tells us that you and I are, have been included to participate he has given us a role and his dominion and his kingdom and his rulership. He has a role for you. We are not saved to be passive. There is no such a concept in the New Testament that you get saved, you sit and wait. It's not biblical. It does not work like that. When you are saved, you are brought into the church, the body of Christ, and you become witnesses. You are being uh, given a task according to gifts, according to skills, according to calling, and according to your faith. Your faith that will grasp what God wants to do with you will motivate you to get active and to do something, to, uh, to take upon responsibilities, to, to desire, to want to do something for the glory of God. Your faith responds and your faith says, yes, Lord, use me. Have you ever prayed this prayer? Lord, here I am, use me. This is what it means, king and priest. 
King is a wonderful thing. Everybody wants to be king. Everybody wants to be, you know, living up there and the, the, you know, high level. Jesus already made us kings. But with this high position, it's like we are kings under the king. We are accountable to a higher king. But it means that we have to live. Okay, if you are an ambassador, for us in the modern time, it's hard to identify with kings. But maybe we will identify more with diplomats, ambassadors, or something like that. If you are ambassadors of your country into another country, and you have children, your children will be taught uh, that they should behave in a certain way because of who you are as parents, because of who you represent, because of your country. And normally, this is passed along. And we are to live in this world in a different way. We are re representing Jesus Christ, who is coming soon. So we cannot just live passively. We cannot live a mediocre way. We have to live high style, not in pride, high style in quality, high style in the manner worthy of the salvation, the price that has been paid, that has been prayed for us. It says we are also priests. We represent as king, we represent um, God to man. Because the way we walk, we reveal Jesus Christ, we reveal God. But as priests, we intercede, we pray, we share the gospel, and we introduce people to God. So we have this dual role. This is given to us by Jesus Christ. And in this first chapter, he's telling us, he wants us to understand that. He wants us to understand that he has saved us for that purpose. Amen? You are saved for a purpose, and we read it about here. And then it, that section finished like, to him, glory and dominion. How many this morning of you will say, to Jesus be dominion? Let me see your hands. To Jesus be dominion, to be glory. That comes with an action. If you declare to God be the dominion and the glory, that means you are giving yourself to his dominion. Amen? It, 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 we must be consequent. Many times we, we see things or we pronounce something, we sing songs, but there is something. If I am going to say to, to Jesus be dominion, then Lord Jesus rule over me. You have a right. You are Lord. You know, we are being saved by the Savior, but we are called to represent the ruler. We are called to give dominion. We are called to, to obey to him. Uh, Mr. Spurgeon says, Each man and woman is a little empire of three kingdoms. Each one of you, you are a little empire with three kingdoms. Body, soul, and spirit. These are your three kingdoms. And when you say to God be dominion, that means make Christ the, the ruler of your three kingdoms. Is Christ the ruler of your body this morning? Is he ruler of your activities, of your hobbies, of, of your intellectualism? Is, is he ruling your life? Everything, what you read, what you do, what you, what you learn? and the purpose of your life and everything. Verse 7 and 8. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Amen. <laughs> I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Behold, He is coming. Behold is an expression, hey, look, pay attention. That is exactly a command. A command, look, that is what it means. Look, He is coming. Pay attention, continue to check out, keep watching. And it is also a declaration of faith. Behold, he is coming. It's certain. He is coming. Uh, this is a fact. He's coming. And this book is going to tell us all the details before he comes. You know, when I was saved uh, that night, 
I went to a meeting and they were showing a movie that was the fulfilling the prophecies of Jesus coming. What would happen in this world before Jesus would come? And that night I got saved. I got scared. I got, I got moved. I got disturbed. And I got shocked by the fact this isn't the Bible. This isn't the Bible. The Bible says that Jesus is coming, he's going to judge the sinners. This is important for you and I to pay attention to this book. And we read about it in my opening sermon on the Revelation. The promises given to those who read it aloud, who meditate upon and receive it and keep it. So it is important that you and I, not only we feed ourselves with the content of that revelation, but we also share it to others because it is so, so captivating uh, something. Nothing else. You know, to talk about the Lord's return, to have a discussion or a Bible study, to, to refresh our mind, to be reminded of this, it lifts our hearts out of this world. You know, we are very much worldly. We are very much captives of what's going on in this world. That's, we, we are made for this world. We live down here and, and our mind is there. You know, sometimes I, I walk and I look at the cement and I hate that. I don't want to look at the cement when I walk. I want to look at the sky. I want to see at the trees. I want to, to look ahead. But sometimes I, cut, I, I catch myself looking down at the asphalt, the broken sidewalk of Hong Kong, and I don't like it. And when I realize it, I, I lift my, my mind and I want to, to look ahead. So we, we are living like that. We look down here. And when you think about the Lord's coming, immediately you, you lift your head lifts and your heart lifts uh, also and it also you know many of us we have like a, a low self-esteem we, 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 we look down we think little about ourselves and everything when you think about the Lord Jesus coming it lifts the whole thing it lifts you up. It makes you think about your role, your responsibilities, your connection with the Lord, uh, your service in the church, your mission work. You know, one of the key motivation for me to move from Canada with a family of four children, six people, by faith to Asia years ago was exactly based on what I'm talking about. I told myself, if Jesus would come back in three years, where would I want to be? And, you know, when I asked myself that question, I said, I want to be in mission. I want to be right there. Even though I'm not sure about the tomorrow, I'm not sure, like, if we have enough money or we are going to live. But I know one thing. I want to be there when he comes. That is one of the key motivations that made me, uh, you know, in my struggle and my fear, will we have enough money for our family, for support? I didn't have an organization. I did not raise funds. I did not go to churches. I just believed that God wanted me to be a missionary. That's how I wanted to go in mission field. I wanted to go in the mission field just like in Acts chapter 13. I wanted to be prayed for. I wanted to be sent for by the, the, by the church. I wanted to be uh, recognized and sent. I did not want to go from church to church and raise funds. That, that was my person. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying that at this time, I didn't want to. But because I was looking forward to the Lord's coming, it helped me to say, yes, Lord, I will trust you and we will go. But you know, Pastor Jennifer, for the last two weeks, preached two wonderful sermons on, on fasting. You know, uh, in, did you know that she broke all the records of listening on YouTube, these two sermons? These two sermons beat all the sermons that have ever been preached since we put sermons on, on that. So that means that she, she touched a subject that people want to know about and want to put in practice. It, 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 everybody recognizes there's something there that is uh, un, untapped, yes, that we have not yet entered fully in that. And she, she did very well and it was so well presented. And uh, you know, she has like more than 200 uh, hits for the, each sermon and all of this. So it's very encouraging but you know I want to tell you something before I came to the mission uh, maybe a month months before I fasted for 40 days 
in my and and not I'm not saying that because I, I can do it. I tried to do it after that and I never could. But that fast, as Pastor Jennifer was pre uh, preaching before, came out of a command of God to me. I was called to do that. And I was working, and I was busy, and all of this, and, and I have done it. And you know, one time during these 40 days, I wanted to experience something. And I read as I was fasting that Jesus went on the mountain alone. So guess what I did? <laughs> I went to spend a night alone on the mountain because I wanted to be spiritual. But let me tell you the truth. When I was alone that night in the mountain, I did not feel spiritual a bit. I was so scared. <laughs> I was so scared. There was so much noise, you know, that <laughs> there was all, all the noise of the night. I was on the mountain, on the rocks, looking down and all of this. And, this, and the whole night I was like this. I just waited for the morning. So anyway, I was not in great communion with God. But I wanted to do it. I wanted to experience it. So I encourage you, if you want to try it, you can try it. Maybe you will be braver than me. But this, when I did it, I did not feel like, you know, like nothing was happening. But I believe that my ability to decide with Brigitte to leave our church and sell our house and leave everything behind was the result of that. The faith has been refreshed, the presence of God, the reality of what we are talking about in this chapter became so, so real. And the return of Jesus was so important to me that it has helped me. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and, and the end, the one who is, was, and is to come. Jesus has a plan for his story. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He has a plan. And he is going to unfold his plan. And he's going to do everything that is just. And he is going to do everything that is pleasing him. He is in control over his story. And he is also uh, very knowledgeable and in control over the events of your life. Wherever you are, in whatever generation you live, whatever country, how many languages you speak, how many degrees you have, what you can do with your life in the kingdom of God, he knows it all. And it's only up to you and me to give that to Jesus and say to you, dominion. If, if he has a dominion, he has a dominion over my talents. He has a dominion over what I am. If, if he is going to have dominion, he has to have it all. And whatever I am, Lord, I, I want to give it to you. And one of the key words in that uh, section here is the Almighty. It's a very interesting uh, expression, pantocrater. It means the one who has his hand on everything. He is the Almighty. He has his powerful, not only his hand, but his, the most powerful hand. A hand of power, a hand of dominion, and he has his hands on over every single thing. He is the Almighty. Is there somebody greater than Almighty? Is that a definition, another word that is bigger than that? All might can do Anything, everything, nothing is too hard. He is, he is that. His hands is in everything. And Jesus wants you this morning to recognize that for your life. We are at the beginning of a year. We are fasting. We're talking to continue to pray and seek the Lord. What do you expect of this year? What do you want in this life? What's your purpose? You want to go shopping? Hong Kong is a big shopping mall. Is that what you want to do? Uh, you, you want just to sit down and relax? Or you want to impact this world like Jesus wants you to? This morning we had the evangelism team. They went out. What's their motivation? Why? They could have been here just sitting and warming themselves here. But no, something in this group is stirring them up. Why? They've been praying. When they were praying, God spoke to their heart and they agreed, let's do it, let's do it. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. Uh, is that easy to approach people on the street and in the park? We want to talk to you about Jesus, you know, but they want to do it because God is doing something. He is the one who has his hand on everything. Whatever we choose to do, Jesus' hands will enable us, will be there ahead of us to equip us. 
the spe special uh, circumstance of the vision, Revelation 1, 9 to 11. And that's the, the part that I, I really love. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulations and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He is introducing himself. I'm your brother. I'm one of yours. He was writing this letter to seven churches of which he was the pastor of the church of Ephesus according to traditions. So God Jesus told him, uh, whatever you see from the past and the future, whatever I'm telling you, write it on a scroll and give it to the churches. But he says, I am your brother. I am a, a co-partner with you in the sufferings because of our association with Jesus, we suffer together of his kingdom and of the patience of Jesus Christ. If you are going to live for Jesus, you will experience levels of sufferings, levels of persecutions, just because you are a believer. And this is something that we share and come in. And you will need a level of patience, patience, long sufferings. I, I'm, even though it's not easy, it's not a vacation to be a Christian, I'm going to uh, hold on to the Lord. I'm going to make it by God's grace. And we have to you know, go through time of injustice. We have to go through times where it requires humility, where we are humiliated, where it is difficult to just go on, where we feel discouraged, where, where we wonder, is it worth it? But he says, I am your co-partner in patience. Patience is something that will determine if we are going to make it in heaven. Because if we become impatient, what will we do? We will turn our back. We will take our life into our own hands and we say, okay, I, I want to be in control by myself. It's not worth it. It's too hard. I cannot go on like this. How many people have quit being Christian because I can't go on anymore? Pastor, you don't understand the trouble I'm in. You, you don't understand how hard my life is. Patience. John is co-partner in the patience in, in Christ. And look at verse 10. This is very interesting. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard. Then later on he says, I turned. Then I saw. What happened uh, and to that one? John wrote the book of Revelation around the year 95 after Jesus Christ, or AD. There was a very, very evil Roman emperor uh, called uh, no, Domitian. This emperor uh, claimed that he was God and asked to be worshipped. Even though it's hard to imagine that somebody would do it, he did it. And everybody, his military forces, everybody had to worship him. But except the Christian refused. And the tremendous persecutions went through all the Roman Empire. And they tracked down the Christians and they killed villages, complete villages. It was horrible. This time has been one of the worst uh, of, of all uh, during this time. And Paul was sent as a result of that, and many, many to the John, sorry, to the island of Patmos. We have we have a map of that, and we'll see see that. And uh, you can see here Patmos, the Ephesus, and John uh, John was a pastor of Ephesus, and then he was sent to Patmos. This was a prison for uh, political prisoners. It was there was mines. And they were working in, in, the, in the quarries. It was a very, very difficult place. Many people died of sickness and everything. And John was very old. You can imagine, John was not far in age from Jesus Christ. So, you know, he must have been between 80 to 90 something at the time of writing this book. So he was not a young man. And he was sent into an horrible place. It was like hell on earth. And he was sent because of his testimony. He was there. But this prison and this time of hardship became one of the spiritual, the highest 
the most elevated revelation that you can even imagine that man had with God. You can, God is not limited, you know. It's not always to an altar call that God uh, works and then reveal. Uh, Paul was in prison. Uh, Ezekiel had a revelation. Uh, Peter was on the roof fasting. And, uh, and, you know, different people had different revelations. But many, many times, people get the greatest revelation of all and the worst sufferings and the worst condition possible and prison because there's no, nothing to, to distract you there's no uh, you know when life goes on and yourself and you, you're in control of everything you, your mind can be all over the place but when you are restricted because of external condition everything is dark there's no books there's no TV there's no smartphone there's nothing you are in the prison or something you alone nothing to do Maybe God can talk to you. Are you can, can I talk to you now? Will you, will you listen now? Yeah, there's no, nothing, nothing more. So John was in the spirit on the Lord's day on that day. And when the, the Domitian uh, died uh, in that year, uh, the next emperor, his, his name was, um, I have it here, Nerva, allowed Christians to leave Patmos and to return. So uh, John returned to Ephesus after his time of being confined. When he was in the spirit, let's go back to, to the text, uh, the, the same text that we were looking at. What was this, the spirit? What does John mean when he was in the spirit? It was not only like... A, to be led by the spirit or to, uh, uh, you know, spirit-filled life. This is not what we are talking because spirit-filled life or to follow the spirit or, you know, it is something that is normal for the Christian. Uh, every Christian should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Every Christian should follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we, we know that. So when he says, I was in the Spirit, it's not like this. Uh, a definition here that a theologian gives us, and it says it very well, says, he was carried beyond normal sense into a state where God could reveal supernaturally the content of this book. He was carried, it's like out of body experience. He was carried beyond normal senses into a state where God could reveal supernaturally the content of that revelation. It was a very, very deep and personal uh, illustration. But John was in the spirit. When, when you say that John was in the spirit, well, we have uh, some disturbance here. <laughs> when we, we see that John was in the spirit, it was his own human mind that was in the spirit. That means that he had to be prepared for that. He had to be ready to have that. And we know John, if you look at one giant of faith in the New Testament, it has to be John. First of all, we know that all prophetic writing comes from the Holy Spirit according to what we have studied in the Bible. And we have a chart here where John is shown to have written three different books in the Bible or three, three sets of uh, divine uh, revelation. You have the Gospel of John. It says, these things have been written so that you may believe. So the goal is to uh, believe and receive new life. This is about salvation. The letters, years later when he was pastoring and touring uh, the churches of Asia, one, two, three, John, be sure, have confidence. This is the confidence that we have, he says. Uh, these things are, are, are written so that you may know, have confidence. And also this is also many tests for your spirituality that he has written. Uh, the one who would claim that he is a Christian and doesn't walk in the light. You have to walk in the light, speak the truth. You have all sorts of uh, darkness, light, truth, lies. Uh, you know, walking, he doesn't sin. The one who believes in Jesus, the seed in him, does not go on sinning. And, and you, this is how you know that what love is. And, and there's a lot of tests, doctrinal tests. And the, don't believe every, every spirit. So this is written to the Christians how to live in the light. 
to live the real Christian life, uh, to love not only in words only, but in actions and, uh, and reality. It's, it's a practical, it's a self-evaluation of your Christian life. How do you know you're living the, the good life in Christ Jesus? First, second, and third John. But this is when he was inspired by the Holy Spirit and he wrote, and he wrote, I wrote these to you, young men, so, so that you will win over the, 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 the enemy. I wrote you that your joy may be perfect. So it is him writing. But in Revelation, it is not him writing. He is recording. It is a message that comes as a supernatural sign to him in a very unique way, and he is recording. He is not writing it up. So if people say, well, John was crazy maybe in his old age. No, he was not. He was recording a vision. He was not writing. He was not inventing uh, these kind of things because he was in a spiritual uh, situation. Matthew Henry gives us a small exhortation this morning, and I want to encourage you. He says, John and his hardship was in the spirit and his prison. He was in, in, in the spirit on the Lord's day. And Matthew uh, Henry uh, writes this here. He says, those like he's talking to us here this morning, those who would enjoy communion with God on the Lord's Day. How many of you, you, you come to the Lord's Day and you want to enjoy communion with God? Yes? yes. Okay. They must seek to draw their thoughts and their affections from earthly things. We come on the Lord's Day. So if I ask you this morning, on the Lord's Day, on Sundays, when you come to church, are you in the Spirit? What will you say? Some say yes, some cannot say yes. And sometimes we, we cannot. Okay, for example, if you go to the bar Saturday night, will you come in the Spirit on Sunday morning? Maybe it will be difficult to enter into it. Uh, if you decide to go shopping Sunday afternoon instead of going to the prayer uh, meeting, uh, will you really be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day? Now you make another choice. Because Matthew Henry says you have to draw your thoughts and affections from earthly things. Okay, parents, you can train your children to be more reverent and sensitive to God by not allowing them to play with their smartphone on the day of the Lord before church or until maybe after lunch so that you can have a pleasant conversation after, after church as well so that this is the, the day of the Lord so we are preparing the next generation to think in such a way because many times parents say oh they are just children so they can sit during the songs they can do their own things during the song service no my children when they were young they were sitting in the front row beside me and they had to follow the service we are at church. This is the house of God. This is the place where God is with us. So we, we force it on our children. Were we mean? Maybe we were mean, you know. But we were mean for a purpose. We were mean for a reason. We wanted our children to not take for granted church, but we wanted them to know God. And we wanted them to respect the, the, the temple, the place, the time, uh, you know, everything. So we, we forced them to, to sit quietly and they had their Bible, even though they didn't know how to read it that they, they were young, and they had to sit quiet. Uh, you know, they, they had to follow. We were at church. And no, 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 no playing. They could play as much as they could after. They could play in the street the whole week long. But when we went to church, it was the time to be in the presence of God. Amen? Amen. So, on the Lord's Day, it's two hours dedicated to God. For the rest of the week is kind of very busy. You're under pressure. You have to work. You have no choice. Some of you have no control of your time. You have your boss and your back over your shoulder. And you are treated like, like a slave. And you have to work whatever the boss tells you to. But Sunday, the Lord's Day, these two hours are dedicated to God. They are meant to give. So if we don't take it. And we let it bypass because my mind is not ready. 
My mind is not free from distractions. My, I have not draw my thoughts and affections from earthly things. I just went to church completely unprepared. It's just like, and I come late. How can you receive when you come late to church? Please, unless you have to because of your employer, there should be no excuse to come to these two most important hours of the week late. You come late. Some people come half an hour in the service. The song service is to finish. And you walk in and you, you push people around because you want to sit right in the, the chair in the middle. Not only you miss, but you make somebody disturbed when they are praying. Is it important when people are singing the song? I was paying attention because I knew what I was going to say more this morning to the words Brother Chris was saying the songs. And some of the words, it says, this is wonderful. And I raised my hands and I prayed to the Lord the words that I was singing. I, I, it was meaningful. And it says, this, these words are true. I am communicating with God this morning with the words of these songs. Okay. On Sunday, usually I'm quite busy. The pastors, we are quite busy. We have all sorts of details to think about. The books, the cards, the announcements, uh, the video camera, the, you know, a lot of things that comes. People come and go, new people come. So our mind has, whew, wow. So if you give me something on, on Sunday, I will probably lose it. <laughs> so that's why I, never, I always refuse to, if people give me money to give to, forget it. I, I never remember after Sunday, too many things come through this, this head. So, sometimes this is how the service starts. Even though I come early and I have a quiet time to try to, to and it does help the quiet time and the prayer. But honestly, when the service starts, many times whoop, the sound or something is just like I go in the back, I come back, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I, you know, sometimes whoop, I go to the fourth floor, then I come back down. And my, my, my uh, safe haven, H-A-V-E-N, a, pa a place of peace, is when I come back and I look at the words of the songs and then I can re-enter to sing the songs. It helps me. So I cannot imagine if you are here and you cannot sing or you, can, or you are unwilling or unprepared to offer yourself through these words to, to say, to God, yes, this is me. You are the greater. You are the highest than, than everyone else. What we sang this morning, many of the words we sang this morning was completely in line with what I'm talking about this morning. Worship makes a difference. It makes a difference and it is important. We are not singing here. I believe Brother Stephen loves worship. You know him. He's, he's always, you know, ready to have his guitar. So is he worshiping because it's Sunday morning and we do it for half an hour? Do you think he comes on Sunday morning just, okay, my guitar, uh, G, C, D, or whatever? No. I think, I don't know how many hours he has spent during the week to come. And he understands the role that he has. So that when the service starts, something will elevate your distracted mind, your weary mind, your, your discouraged mind. And it will bring you back, give you a chance. At least it offers to you an opportunity to seize. You can seize it or not seize it. You can miss out on worship as much as you want. You can come on the Lord's day and not be in the Spirit and miss out. Or you can decide, this is important to me. And I'm telling you that this letter is written to the churches to remind you this morning that on the Lord's Day, you should come to church in the Spirit so that you are ready to receive whatever God. This is, God reveals Himself. When we come to church on Sunday, God speaks. But God can speak to one person, and just sitting next, God doesn't speak. 
Why? Because one is in the spirit on the Lord's day, and the other one has not had the time or the ability. His mind has not yet opened up, and his spirit is not. There's too much. You know, some of you have lost your emotions. You have lost the emotions. That's one of the messages of uh, Revelation chapter 2. You've lost it. That's what I have against you. There's no emotion. You listen intellectually to the sermon. You can be a cynic about the, the, the style of the preacher. You can be critical about it. You can analyze the theology and understand it and be very knowledgeable of the word, of the, of, of the, the content and the doctrines of God and not be in the spirit. It's up to you to be in the spirit. So John is showing us this morning in this example, on that day, in the prison, in the worst of conditions, in his age where he was maybe a feeble man, an old man, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I believe it's not only on that day that he was in the spirit, because he could receive that kind of visitation from heaven because his mind was trained, because he's already uh, evaluated, he progressed, his spirituality progressed. If his spirituality would not have been prepared and progressed, he couldn't, God could not have sent an angel to him. How many of us this morning, if God would bring an angel to you, you would maybe not be able to recognize it or be. Or God could not even, and that's probably why he doesn't. Because we are not in the spirit. We are, we are completely unprepared. So I want to urge you this morning to be uh, prepared. We have to walk with the spirit. The Old Testament, I was just like looking. Uh, can you put the one on the Holy Spirit? Uh, are you in the spirit? So if you come late, you're unprepared or irre irreverent, you cannot be in the spirit. You cannot gain from it. You know, I, I quoted many of the scriptures that just came to my mind about the Holy Spirit. He was in the ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe the voice of God is speaking and you don't hear it. Or you hear it, but you are unwilling to yield and give dominion and to him. It says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5 of Book of Acts, they lied to the Holy Spirit. Simon, the magician, even after he confessed to believe in Jesus, could, wanted to buy the power of the Holy Spirit and use it for his own benefit. We are exhorted not to grieve the Holy Spirit. We are exhorted not to quench the Spirit. And the, the New Testament goes on and on and on on scriptures about the Holy Spirit and our relationship with God. Our success, uh, our fruitfulness, our efficiency, and, and, our, and our salvation really depends on the Holy Spirit. If we are walking along, if we are uh, controlled, Romans 8, uh, uh, we should be ruled by the Spirit, we should pray in the Spirit at all times. Does that, does these scriptures describe you? Does that describe a, your Christian walk? Is it possible to live like this? To, to live in the spirit, to be controlled, to think like the spirit thinks, to seek what the spirit seeks, to be, to be in the Lord from Monday to, 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 to next Sunday? Can we do that? Yes, we can. This is the New Testament. This is written. This is how Christian lives. This is for us. So when we come to church on Sunday, it is a time to readjust. If we are weakening during the week or we are distracted or things are tough, you come to church on Sunday. The Holy Spirit will lift you up. The Holy Spirit will build you up. The Holy Spirit will re-equip you and resend you more powerful if you are in the Spirit on the Lord's day. If you are not, forget it. You enter weak, you go out weak. You, en you enter uh, disappointed, you go, you go out angry. I wish none of us will ever leave this church angry. <laughs> angry in the spirit or angry against, I don't know. We should not. We should enter here and just be in the presence of the Lord. Amen? And the spirit, that is why, that is why we meet.
Okay, so I'll stop here. I still have other things, but I think that's the, the, the message like this morning. Are you in the spirit? Or do you want to be in the spirit? Are you trained to be in the spirit? Are you trained, like there's this book, I remember, trained in the school of prayer. I think it's Andrew Mary, like uh, the, the, the school of prayer. Could Jesus meet you today? If he talks to you, the voice of God, like John says, then I heard a voice. And then he described the voice of Jesus. It's amazing, the voice of Jesus, like a thunder, like a trumpet. He heard, then he, he turns, and then he saw. Then he fell on his face, just like that. He was trained, he was prepared. But you know one thing about John, this is, this is amazing. John had spent three years with Jesus Christ. He was like the disciple that Jesus loved. Like there was already this intimate connection. But he was not prepared to see Jesus Christ and his glory like given. When he saw Jesus and his glory, he fell on his face like dead and terror. But what did Jesus do? What did Jesus speak? Words of comfort. Don't be afraid. Words to lift up. Words of encouragement. And this is what Jesus wants you and me to, to discover in this chapter. Many of us, we, we know Christmas. The little Jesus and the manger is so sweet, little Jesus. And it is important that we know that, okay? Uh, we see Jesus on the cross. We see Jesus depicted what he has accomplished. But we have never seen and we would have never had anything like this if John would not have been in the spirit on that day. And John was not ready to see that. I mean, in that sense, he knew Jesus for three years, the best body. But when he saw the glory, wow. And Jesus says, I want you to write in the scroll what you see. I want you to describe me to the church as I am allowing you to see me. Tell them what I am in my glory. Show them the power, the alpha, the omega. Show them the one that is eternal and never changed. The one that has his hands of dominion and everything in this world. The one that has a control over the history of this world. Show them. Tell them what I look like. My hair. The face like the sun, the, the eyes, penetrating eyes, Tell the, the sword of the, of the word of God, the feet like in fire, describe my glory to my church so that they, when they go through the tough time in, the, in, the, in their life, they will lift up their heads, their burden will be le less heavy, and they will be able to persevere and with patience for the coming of Jesus Christ because they see the glory, they see wisdom, and control. They see the power right in a scroll and give each revelation. And this is not one revelation that John is writing. The book of Revelation is not one revelation. Many times, I think 10 times or 12 times, he is told in the book of Revelation to write. One time he is told not to write something that he has seen. But 12 times he writes he is told, he is commanded, write it and share it. And one of the last statements in the books of uh, Revelation is, do not hide it. Do not keep people from seeing it. They must know about it. They must hear about it. They must receive the message. So this message is for you. It is to lift up your faith, that your, your faith will be so strong, nothing will shake you anymore. And you will not be of those who quit and abandon their faith or shrink and lose your reward, but you will be of those that persevere and win the prize at the end because the re your revelation of Jesus Christ is so amazing. Amen? Amen? That's why we have this chapter one. Let's stand. Hallelujah.